delighted to have you here. When I asked Rahul, Rahul is Not too many years ago, Rahul, as you all know, was a student here, etc. Which is, of course, the reason why he's accomplished so much. Um, <laughs> when I asked him, when I asked him who he would like to introduce him, and he says, perhaps one of my teachers, and I immediately called up Vasavda Sab, who was his teacher in studio and his thesis guide. Uh, who, that's where the beginnings were. So I request Vasarda Sahib to come and introduce you. Thank you very much. It is indeed a unique moment for me to introduce Professor Rahul Merotra here this evening. Professor Merotra, as you all know, is an alumnus of School of Architecture set, having done his architecture in early 80s. This is his homecoming of sort after his appointment as a professor and chair of the Department of Urban Planning and Design at the Harvard Graduate School of Design of the Harvard University. Rahul Mehrotra is a professor of urban design and planning. He is a practicing architect, urban designer, and educator. Welcome everybody. In 90 in Mumbai, and has designed and executed projects for clients that include government and non-governmental agencies corporate as well as private individuals and institutions. RMA Architects has also initiated several unsolicited project, projects driven by the firm's commitment to advocacy in the city of Mumbai. The firm has designed a software campus for Hewlett Packard in Bangalore, a campus for Magic Bus, an NGO for uh, poor children, the restoration of Chao Mahalla Palace in Hyderabad, and with the Taj Mahal Conservation Collaborative, a conservation master plan for Taj Mahal. The firm is currently working on a social housing project for 100 elephants and their caretakers in Jaipur, as well as a corporate office in Hyderabad and several single family houses in different parts of India. Merotra has written and lectured extensively on issues to do with architecture, conservation, and urban planning in Mumbai and India. His writings include co-authoring Bombay, The Cities Within, which covers the city's urban history from the 1600s to the present, Panganga, Sacred Tank, Public Places in Bombay, Anchoring a City Line, a history of cities, commuter railway, and Bombay to Mumbai, changing perspectives. He also co-authored Conserving an Image Center, the fourth precinct in Bombay. Based on this study and its recommendations, the historic fort area in Mumbai was declared a conservation precinct in 1995, the first such designation in India. 
He, his other publications include books on the Victoria Terminus Station, a World Heritage Site in Mumbai, on the impact of conservation legislation there, the most recently on that city's Art Deco buildings. In 2000, he edited a book for the UIA that earmarks the end of century and is titled The Architecture of 20th Century in the South Asian Region. Merodra has also edited the first of the three books that document the 2004 Michigan debates on urbanism and in 2011 wrote Architecture in India since 1990, which is reading of contemporary architecture in India. He has long been actively involved in civic and urban affairs in Mumbai, having served on commissions for the conservation of historic buildings and environmental issues with various neighborhood groups and from 1994 to 2004 as executive director of Urban Design Research Institute. He studied at the School of Architecture Ahmedabad SEPT and graduated with a master's degree with distinction in urban design from the GST. He has taught at the University of Michigan and at the School of Architecture and Urban Planning at MIT. His current research involves looking at India's medium-sized cities and the borders, uh, broader emergent patterns of urbanism in India. Merotra's ongoing research is focused on evolving a theoretical framework for designing and conditions of formal growth, what he refers to as the kinetic city. He has run several studios looking at various aspects of planning, questions in the city of Mumbai under the, under the rubric of extreme urbanism. Uh, Merotra is a member of the steering committee of the South Asia Initiative at Harvard and curates their series on urbanization. He currently is leading a university-wide research project with Professor Diana Ek called the Kumbh Mela, mapping the ephemeral city. Rahul in 1977 was one of my co-learners. With many others in Studio 3, which I had then started, we started trying to understand the design, <coughs> understanding nature and nature of nature, with the laws of nature, with the rules of man, and with principles which belong to all, as Khan used to say. This was our co-learning along with others an inspiration to learn further towards understanding the institutions of man in later years at pre-final level. <coughs> I was fortunate to have two peers, themselves great learners, as my constant guides who inspired me to learn from nature. Khan used to say, one is always primarily serving an institution and an institution comes from inspiration. And these inspirations are inspirations to live, the inspirations to learn. So learning is a kind of inspiration. It has to do with the seeking of nature to express that which is fundamentally inexpressible. These are not surface things. But even when we consider the inspirations to learn, it might be that all we want to learn is how we are made. If we knew how we were made, we would know all the laws of universe because everything that nature makes must make it by the laws of universe. Goethe always insisted on reflecting on the meaning of things. When you read him, you should never listen to him, but you should listen to that which belongs to the eternal. <coughs> Kant thought this to be a wonderful thought, as this is really art. It isn't you that you are making. It isn't just a question of believing something yourself. Because the reality you believe isn't your belief. It's the belief of everyone. Our co-learning made us aware of sources of inspiration, institution of man, the eternal presence, and the belief in belief of man, which I'm sure were instrumental driving force for us during the studio learnings. All these sharing and co-learnings gets carried forward through learners like Rahul and finds broader meanings in our field. 
It is once again my great pleasure to introduce a learner here, and I welcome him to share his life and learnings to enrich the institution of learning in service of our great discipline. Thank you all. Thank you, Professor Basavra. Uh, <clears throat> it truly is a pleasure to be here, and thank you, Bimal, for, for this invitation. I'm also emotional and honored that so much, so many of my teachers are in this room. Professor Toshi, uh, Jeremy Mehta, Leo Pereira, Sushan Jain, others who I might not have spotted. And it's humbling, it's uh, making me terribly nervous uh, to be able to, you know, to, to share this. But uh, it is absolutely an honor, so thank you very much uh, once again. Uh, it's also a bit intimidating because in many ways it's like bringing coals to Newcastle because the kinds of thoughts that one has developed here are so familiar. So I'm a bit nervous about that because the familiarity suddenly might not make sense here, but I hope it does and I'm going to attempt to share with you some of my thoughts, some of my thoughts that have evolved <clears throat> in the last 20 or 22 years having graduated and started practice. But uh, the day I graduated is very clear in my mind and every moment of the time I spent here is very, very clear. Uh, this image for me of Dinesh Mehta is an important one. Perhaps you might get these lights out, it might be better. Uh, is, 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 I think, the moment that one actually arrived at the school. Uh, and it's important because for me, it, it, it reminds me, it reminds me, uh, it's symbolic of the moment of the place. Uh, it's the moment when uh, Hasmukh Patel had begun to uh, lead the school. Uh, Professor Doshi's uh, presence was there. His incredible generosity in terms of sharing his network. I remember in my first semester here, we heard Aldo Van Eyck, we heard uh, Paolo Soleri, we had uh, uh, Buckminster Fuller all go through. And I mean, the impact that has on students who just arrive and are embracing architecture is tremendous. So those moments ring so clear. Uh, they were so fundamental in our own formations. Uh, and one is eternally grateful uh, for all of that. And there are many people in this slide uh, who are yet present, who uh, you all will remember, somebody there adjusting his camera who's in the audience, uh, and many others. So it really was this moment of pluralism, uh, which, was, which is something one was very much exposed to here. And I think very important, very unique about this school, the idea that it was a place where only practitioners were really teaching, or largely 95%. I don't know any other school where the practitioners overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly actually educate students in the way that it happened here. And I think that's something that SEP should be very proud of. And I think the moment has come where some of this reflection, perhaps, Bimal, you should lead a project like this, on the history of SEPT and the contribution uh, through its own experiences that it can put out to the world, which might resonate uh, much more broadly. Being a student here, this is the kind of work we did for our thesis. This is my design thesis with Professor A.D. Rajay, looking at Lakha Patelni Pol, uh, looking at the culture, the heritage of the place, looking at the density, finding a site where one could actually build, uh, actually, and then looking at a proposition, uh, co-opting an existing house, so being exposed through the discussions Mr. Kulbushan Jain had, Basavra had about heritage, about recycling. And I'm just sharing this very quickly because this is fundamental to what one finally did. And of course, these are all hand-drawn and hand-rendered, which was beautiful. The kinds of models we made, the idea of building in components so that you could carry a truss on a cycle with two people uh, for construction, so the notion of prefabrication. But I mean, I think the idea that you could go all the way from looking at a broader cultural landscape in the way the studios were organized, but also looking at building systems, looking at fine scales, was an incredible, incredible uh, experience. And I just put this out there in those three slides to just reinforce how much one uh, got out of the place and how one built on it. And I think uh, the contributions of my teachers will be evident to them. Uh, I will not hi highlight it explicitly because I think that would be demeaning it in a sense, uh, but it's fundamental to what, has, what one has done ever since. So I'm gonna jump back to the title which also is an emblematic title for me working in Mumbai. Because this is emblematic in the way uh, the city has actually had a bearing uh, on, only the, on the work that I've sort of done. And I think architects and designers really working in India are now dealing with an entire gamut of social, cultural, economic phenomena that are molding the built environment, as we all know, at incredibly phenomenal rates. 
Uh, and I think the role of the professional architect, something we must question, something I remember we were questioning even in the 70s and 80s here, has been sort of marginalized. And I think this is very important because within conventional practice, the professional does not engage with the broader landscape, but rather chooses uh, to operate within the specificity of the site. I mean, that's something that becomes a natural response. And in the process, we become really disconnected with the context of practice, the context that we are operating in. So the word context is something that we should interrogate a little more carefully. So our approach of working in Mumbai has been to actually use the city. And of course, this one sees much more clearly in retrospect. So I mean, I, I don't want to give the wrong message to students that one was totally clear about this path. It's only after 25 years, after starting to teach, after reflecting about one's own experiences, that this becomes really clear. And in, in doing that, now I realize how much one learned from the city in engaging with the city, sometimes intuitively, sometimes just to respond as a citizen and then trying to make sense of that. Because then one draws nourishment from a context like that, uh, and one has learned that the definition of the profession must be much more elastic, where we must see multiple disciplines, multiple modes of engagement as being simultaneously valid uh, in engaging with this sort of what I call kinetic urban landscape of Indian cities and their peri-urban sort of regions. And I think the, uh, in India, I mean, I think there, there's something happening here in this post-liberalized sort of economy. I was sharing with friends earlier last evening that, you know, you go through all our new airports, there's an amazing mismatch between the physical plant and the social cultural landscape that occupies it. I mean, I, was, I arrived in Chennai two days ago, and I was talking to the bag, bag handler, and I was coming from Goa to Chennai. That bag handler didn't even know what Goa was, where it existed. And you know, we are sitting in this. So I mean, I think our physical infrastructure is sort of trying to communicate this idea that, that India is competent in engaging with the broader urban landscape, whether it's our hotels. There's an amazing mismatch between the physical plant that we are creating with appropriated images from around the world, senseless sometimes, and the occupants of these sort of physical pieces of infrastructure. And so I think like context, we should go back and even interrogate what the local and the global means. Uh, and this is, I think, a binary. The local and global is among many binaries that we set up in the profession, like the formal and the informal city. I think it's completely non-productive for designers, because what designers should be engaging in is in seeing spatial possibilities where these binaries actually dissolve. But when we live and reside in either of these binaries, we have alliances to those binaries. So then we work only with the informal city or the formal, formal city, or we are part of the project of the globalizing India or part of the project of the localizing of India. And I think this needs to sort of blur. I think politicians have always been sort of really good at this. Uh, of, of using the region uh, as a way, developing narratives around it. And I think the evocation of local specificities, that is fetishizing the local, whether it's craft or tradition, we tend to do that. There's much more of that happening, I think, as a reaction to the process of globalization. And I think it amounts to fetishizing, because it doesn't really get contextualized within the context, is, I think, an easy and a simplistic way to critique the homogenizing effects of globalization. I think, for me, this is very important. And this sort of results in this sort of fetishizing of local specificity. And I think the notion that globalization amounts to homogeneity is, I think, a dead concept. I think it's been flawed for too long to be productive. And I don't think it's productive for designers. Because differences are not just about local specificity, but about how these differences are networked globally. That how these sort of differences actually become part of a network in our global world, and they resonate across this. And so I think urban India, so I think, sorry, I, mean, I think one more point before I go on, I think therefore we have to engage with new meta-narratives because that, I think, places us in a good position as designers. And so urban India, for example, in this post-liberalized economy starting in the 1990s or 91, 92 to be accurate, is characterized by physical and visual contradictions that collapse in landscapes of incredible pluralism charged with polarity, with uh, adjacencies that are bizarre as you see in this image. With globalization and the emergence of a post-industrial service-based economy in Indian cities, urban space has been fragmented, as we all know, and polarized with the rich and poor jostling for access to amenities, whether it's water, whether it's basic forms of infrastructure. Further, what is interesting is that the state has more or less given up 
on the responsibility of projecting the idea of India through the built and physical environment, as it had done in the post-independence era with several state capitals being built, fantastic government and educational projects, uh, which were all about representing the idea of a new India. Today, the major state-directed projects are highways, flyovers, airports, telecommunication networks, electricity grids that connect urban centers but don't contribute to determining or guiding their physical form. And so there is this new architecture of statistics. I mean, look at the numbers that get thrown, uh, whether it's by Mr. Modi or anyone else. It's statistical architecture that sort of is about constructing the image of the state. And so in India's post-liberalized economy, cities and their peripheries have become sites for the shifting of responsibility and concurrently an evolving relationship, a new relationship between private and the public. And today, private capital chooses to build environments that are insulated from their context. Again, the word context. Without the burdens of facilitating citizenship or place making necessary in a real city. These gated communities take the form of vertical towers or peripheral gated communities, etc. In fact, in the state controlled economy, the physical relationship between different classes was often orchestrated according to a master plan founded upon entitlement, housing, and proximity to employment, all those basic good things. In the new economy, the fragmentation of services and production location has resulted in a new bazaar-like urbanism that has woven its presence through the entire urban landscape. And the biggest problem that emerges from that is the question of inequity. And I think for architects, for your generation, which is 92% or 99% of this audience, I think the challenge of the role of architecture in the question of inequity is going to be absolutely fundamental. Whether you're talking about urban design, you're talking about architecture, how you soften thresholds between polarized parts of society is going to become critical. What has also happened is that in every society, at, every, at different times, there are different outlets for ostentation. So in India, it's been weddings. It's actually education is a form. The amount we, we invest in education, or our parents do, or parents did and we do for our children, is astounding. Weddings, jewelry, all of that. And that was in this sort of socialist kind of era where ostentation had to be internalized. Ostentation now is beginning to find, and this is emblematic, an extreme form, uh, I hope an aberration, uh, where ostentation is finding its way into the built environment. We want to, you know, whether it's our homes, it started with interiors in places like Bombay where people spend like crores of rupees. Now it's houses, it's farmhouses. The built environment is becoming a huge outlet for ostentation. So how you as a generation begin to negotiate that, being mindful of this inequity is going to be an absolutely critical challenge. And the future of the profession depends on how you negotiate this challenge. And so, Really, the question is that the context is one thing, and that's, I think, simplistic. So we look at a context, we look at a site, uh, we begin to respond to what's next to it, we look at some aspects of history, we look at climate, we look at local traditions. I think that is a very simplistic definition of the context. One of my colleagues at Harvard talks about, asks the question, what is the context of the context? What is the context in which the context nestles? And to order to, in order to define that, we have to construct new meta-narratives through which we can actually understand this, which is what will give architecture the edge again, I think, to negotiate with this sort of context. So the question you should be asking is, what is the context of the context, not just defining the context in the way we use it very easily, like we use the word sustainability and many other things. And so what are these meta-narratives that can, I think, help us? So one meta-narrative for me, which is important in the context of India, and this goes back to what I was saying about how the, there's a misfit between the society that's occupying the airports and five-star hotels um, and the physical plant, is in societies like India, uh, for example, when we talk about modernism and modernity, they, 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 aesthetic modernity came to India before social modernity, which is what this image shows. And I think it came because of neighbor, if they, I mean, I don't want to go into that. There were reasons, of course, that it happened. But unlike the West, where aesthetic modernity came out of a social modernization project, which had to do with an independent bourgeois, it had to do with uh, 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 capital markets being constructed, and of course, industrialization, which happened in India. Here, aesthetic modernity arrived before social modernity. And there was an amazing mismatch in that generation of post-independence architects who actually on the cutting edge were 
that was the dilemma they were actually struggling with in terms of how do you make that modernism relevant to the society, to the craft traditions, to the culture, to the climate. And it was a heroic period for that reason. But this disjuncture is a critical one that we have to begin to negotiate in some way. So that, I think, is a meta-narrative. Another one that is interesting, and there might be many, I'm just pointing out a few, is this idea of transition. So we have moved from a socialist society in as terms of our political ideology into what we are calling a capitalistic one through our liberalization process. We imagine, or in our imagination, or in the way the built environment plays itself out, there is an implicit belief that this is an easy transition. That means you one day wake up and you're a capitalist society. It's not true. Like East Europe, India, many parts of the world, there are going to be simultaneous transitions in place, which means for decades we are going to transition out of socialism, and for decades we are going to transition into some other hybrid form of capitalism. And the built environment is the one that gets affected the most by this sort of uh, uh, blur or by this sort of messiness that happens when there are two transitions in place. So it's not a simple transition. Now it's very important to articulate a position and articulate a debate as a community of architects around what that means. It has implications of systems of patronage, it has implications on protocols and processes, and all of this is something I don't believe we have enough of a conversation. We are also a mutinous democracy. It's a particular form of democracy. I don't want to go into that. The question of the role of the state becomes, I think, in interesting, because the agency of planning and design is linked to that. The role of NGOs. What does civil society mean? We don't, we don't, that isn't yet become a form of patronage for us. Of course, there's some NGOs working around, but I think we need to, again, interrogate that question. Uh, and so there are many, many such, uh, meta-narrative, so to speak, that we can begin to construct, which I believe will be much more useful. And this has been something uh, that has been very much of interest to me uh, in terms of understanding uh, you know, what's happening in the world around us. And so if you extend that, you begin to look at this. This is the research that Professor Vasabra was alluding to. And it's very interesting if you look at India to see what's happening. Seven, seven megacities, our gaze is completely locked there. 28 tier two cities, we know a little bit about it, some of, some of us operate there. You look at this statistic, it's mind boggling, 100,000 people to a million people. One scenario is that there'll be a million people in 400 little towns that we don't even know. I mean, I can almost bet that if we start naming those places, collectively we might reach 100 or 150. You won't even get halfway, because this is totally off our radar. And again, I know schools like this are beginning to negotiate these areas, but that for this generation, your generation of architects, that is going to be where the sites of production will be. That's where the change is going to come. And what does that mean in terms of pedagogy is I think a question I would leave to many teachers. So if you look at this just historically for a moment, is this was the post-independence sort of scenario. This is the axis of modernism, uh, starting from Chandigarh, New Delhi, Baroda, Ahmedabad, Goa. You could argue Pondicherry because some things had happened there earlier that there was a tradition. And this was also the axis of patronage because this is where industry occurred, this is where finance was located. This was the, the new India that emerged. Calcutta, of course, disappeared from the scene by that time. Now, in the post-liberalized economy, there is this new axis that is developing, uh, which doesn't carry the burdens or it doesn't carry the, uh, the kinds of traditions, the protocols that that axis of modernity uh, carried. And that was where I was trained. Uh, I just was very fortunate for many reasons that I got all my early work here. And it was a landscape I just couldn't understand. Uh, the protocols were different. Uh, the obsession with the Vastu was mind-boggling. It was more important than the brief. Uh, you could give them one less bedroom, but if the Vastu was wrong, it was problematic. So it, there were a whole difference. Set. The, the baggage of aesthetics was completely different. Uh, the, the, the kind of aspiration in this sort of zone as people built through the 60s and 70s, the engagement with the modern vocabulary was critical. Here the images are completely different. And if this landscape explodes as it will, you're going to get many, many more modes of practice that you would have to engage with. So the point here is that the elasticity by which we have to operate in engaging with this environment, the criticality with which we have to look at the baggage, 
both which our education often carries because of its own historical sort of perspectives, etc., is humongous. And I think looking at this frame critically in terms of pedagogy for everyone who's a teacher is also because what it means is we have to engage with different modes of engagement, different models of practice, different ways of communicating, and each of these modes of models of practice have completely different protocols uh, that sort of follow it. And so, for me, actually, the research of Professor Vasavra was kind enough to list some of these has been about actually documenting this, about writing about this. Now, these publications are not all scholarly books, and this is the foundation, in a sense, of our practice. Some of them are scholarship, some of them are instruments of advocacy as a way of buying credibility with constituencies, with communities. <coughs> For me, when I studied urban design and I left the school and I came back to India, I only realized 25 years later when I was being hired for a job to head an urban design department, they asked me for my portfolio. And I said, I don't have a portfolio of urban design projects. I had gone away learning that urban design was a bridge practice. It wasn't even a discipline. It was a practice that evolved to create feedback loops between the site specificity of architecture and the abstraction of planning, which had really become blobs of color on a land use plan. And urban designers were people who were trained, in a sense, to bridge that gap. Now, the moment you accept that it's about feedback loops, then inherently it's about advocacy, because it's about communicating, it's about closing those loops, it's about learning from the uh, learning about planning and planning policy and seeing what the three-dimensional implications will be. So it is by nature about advocacy, which means then we have to develop the tools for advocacy, the instruments for advocacy, the credibility for advocacy. And therefore, I think this is very fundamental for all of you as you go on in these modes of practice different instruments become more powerful uh, than the others. So with that, I'm going to sort of share with you very quickly some observations from Mumbai. This is a lecture in itself, so I won't spend much time. Uh, I just think it's instrumental in the way we think about things. I'm going to then just run through projects quite quickly, but just to share with you some concerns I have with the way I deal with projects, and I'm going to show you six projects in a slightly little more depth. Uh, to address some of the con co questions that I've raised about the global, the local, about what the context might be. So working in Mumbai, for me, was about blurring these binaries, about dissolving the idea of these polarities, and it's about negotiating a landscape where global fo flows don't really, and I think this is true for Ahmedabad, they don't erase and remake landscapes, but are forced to occupy local fissures creating fascinating hybrid conditions and startling adjacencies, which is what we're all dealing with. We don't know how quite to reconcile these ad adjacencies. And some of the practitioners call this the informal city. For me, like I said, that's not productive. I think one of the fundamental problems using the binary, as I said, is that you have to reside in one of them. And then you don't, it's a trap in a sense. And I think Mumbai perhaps challenges this new neat equation of the binary. I'm using Mumbai emblematically. I could say the Indian city, and it might work as well. And more importantly, I think, the question is how do we situate ourselves as designers and how we might be inspired by the design intelligence of the kinetic city, is what I refer to it, to intervene as designers and activists in our own localities. And I think there's some specific aspects of the city that kind of bore on our practice. Mumbai, as it's now um, referred to like several cities in India in, and perhaps around the world in this post-industrial scenario, has resulted in a new system with the fragmentation of services and production vocation. It's resulted in this bazaar-like urbanism that I was talking about. And it's an urbanism created by those outside the elite domains of the formal modernity of the state, what Ravi Sundaram refers to as a pirate modernity that slips under the laws of the city simply to survive without any conscious attempt at constructing a counterculture. And this phenomenon is really critical to the city being connected to the global economy. However, the spaces it creates have been largely excluded from the cultural discourse on globalization, which usually focuses on the elite domains of production in the city, elite domains of public space, etc. So it's not the city of the poor. And I think this is why the binary is problematic for me. So because even the informal, it comes out of economy that we call it informal economy. A lot of people who live in what we call the informal city uh, actually are employed in the formal economy. So it is the aesthetic of informality that is also a red herring in this whole discussion. So I think this is what I call the kinetic space. It's not the space of the poor or the regular models of the formal and informal, but it is um, uh, a space where these models actually collapse 
into singular entities where meanings are shifting uh, and being blurred all the time. And it is through the space, the space of the kinetic city, that I think we should focus our attention much more urgently. Uh, and the question is, can we design for these spaces as architects? I think we should ask that question, conservationists, urban designers, planners. And can we design with a divided mind if we are trying to make this sort of healing? And so. This is a diagram I found in the yearbook here uh, in 1979. I've never found the source of it, so I can't credit it, but it's from that. Uh, it came of great use to me many years later. But this, this is the diagrams that explain how our cities are really made, the incrementalism by the, this guy's in the third stage of squatting. And of course, there's a whole typology, there's an intelligence if you begin to actually make it much more objective. The space is elastic, as in Ganpati, when these spaces are used, where streets are appropriated to become a community hall just for 10 days and goes back to normalcy. So the densities create these particular situation, and that's to scale. Mumbai, that's the kind of open space we have in Mumbai. And compared to Tokyo and Delhi, it's totally incredible. And of course, what does that do? Uh, it's also fragmented, because of you know, if you compare it to Manhattan, for example, and cricket pitches, this wonderful uh, Indian game that the British invented. Uh, and, you know, it gets co-opted for weddings. The pitch is not touched because it's sacred. There's a kind of, there is a logic about this. And, this. and it goes back to normalcy. So if you look at this it, it kinetic city, for me what characterizes it uh, is elasticity, incre incrementalism, appropriation of space, and the softening of thresholds. In our cities, in the Indian city, the threshold is very soft. And I think what we have to be aware of is architecture is the biggest criminal in hardening these thresholds. We create very harsh thresholds through the architecture we make. And this is something we shouldn't sort of forget. So the kinetic city obviously cannot be seen as a design tool, rather a demand that conceptions of urbanism create and facilitate environments that are versatile, flexible, robust, ambiguous enough to flourish, to allow the kinetic quality of the city to flourish. In fact, Architecture is not even the spectacle of the city. Not, not, it doesn't even comprise the single dominant image of the city. In fact, festivals such as this, Navratri, uh, Tazia, Moharam, uh, Dasera, those are much more powerful sort of instruments in terms of the spectacle of the city. And their presence on the everyday life uh, is, is very critical. It dominates, actually, uh, the city. Immersion here becomes the metaphor for the spectacle of the city. And as the clay idol dissolves in the water of the bay, the spectacle comes to a close. There are no static or permanent mechanisms to encode the spectacle. Here, the memory of the city is an enacted process and temporal moment, as opposed to buildings that contain the public memory as static or permanent entities. The city and its architecture don't even mean the same thing uh, and can't be contained in a single meaning. Within the kinetic city, meanings are not stable. Spaces get consumed, reinterpreted, recycle. The kinetic city actually appropriates the static city to create new spectacles. And I think it's the, quite the opposite to where architecture is the sole spectacle or instrument for representation of whether it's power or memory of the city. And I call these the landscapes of impatient capital. It's impatient capital that makes this. And that's why buildings have to be built very quickly. The vendors derive the architecture, not the architects. Uh, it has to be deployed very quickly. And all the cities that make the landing of capital frictionless, we celebrate Dubai, Shanghai. But these are, they're, they're, they're singular aspirations in these cities. And it's only impatient capital that demands the way they are made. And I think this is something that must be resisted because it's going to be highly problematic. And so the opposite of that is reclaiming, uh, of altering, of conserving. Again, a fundamental lesson in the 70s, one learned very much in this place through many teachers here who were doing work in this area. So that's been part of the work that we've done. We've been involved in, in reclaiming little spaces, talking to our clients, the little shed that we converted into an installation space in the eastern waterfront as a way of getting the elite from the city to begin to engage with these spaces, a car garage that we made into an installation space, a printing press that we converted into an art space. It's reclaiming, altering, even if it's a holding strategy for a short period of time. The temporal scale is critical as we learn from the kinetic city. So sometimes, like that shed I showed you in the eastern waterfront, we knew it would last for five years. We worked out with a client the economics of doing that, and it, it, was, it was a temporal moment 
dormant in a sense, ephemeral, because it came and before you knew it, it disappeared with very little investment. I was very frustrated when I started off my career because I only got interior projects to do. And it was Professor Rajay who was working on my thesis. He one day when I was talking to him, he said, Look, you'll make it much more interesting if you confront the architecture. Don't treat it as an interior project of layers and layers that cover the architecture. And so that was something that resonated in my mind through these projects. And all these projects, you see, we confronted the architecture, and it completely becomes an other kind of project. Of course, we moved into conservation as a way of extending this idea. This is the Chaumala Palace, the Char Minar, as you see. And it was an interesting project because, of course, there's this question of conservation. But it was also public space. Look at the density here. And what you see in red was already encroached upon. So our client actually appointed a lawyer who played, played the lead in this project. It was about stabilizing what we could save before we could save it. And that process of documentation and legal questions took three years before this project, which took seven more years. It's a 10-year project that it got done. But one learned a lot about this. One reconnected. And one had been inspired by the measure drawing trips we made here at SEPT. And we documented this extensively, enjoyed it very much. Uh, we engaged in new materials. Again, things we were exposed to here through Kulbushan and Meena Jain and many others. Uh, learning how lime, you need a patience for lime, how this is a post and beam construction, but the lime is built over it over months. There's a whole time, there's a whole temporal range to it then how with very minimal interventions one can actually bring it to life, give it new significance, in this case with very low budgets, a museum, this is the central piece, the Khilwat, all of this was restored, that ceiling is completely new. Of course we can afford the crafts here, which is a luxury, and we have to respect that. But then, confronting these same questions in Mumbai was very interesting. Because in a post-colonial situation, where the custodians of a culture and the creators of the culture are, are two completely different cultures, it's problematic. So the kind of narratives that all my colleagues who studied at York came back with was interesting. I always found it very problematic because they were picking up the narratives uh, of English heritage, let's say, for a second. And in London, you can apply that because the, 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 the custodians and the creators are the same culture. So they're extending emotive questions. It, so you know, you evoke the queen and everyone gets nostalgic with tears in their eyes. You can understand that in London. You can't understand that in Bombay. And so I was wondering why they were using nostalgic. They were worrying about Edward the Seventh and things like that. And you know, one day I took a taxi and I told the taxi driver who was clearly from UP or Bihar, I said, you know, I jumped into the taxi and said, Kala Ghoda, I want you to go to the area, Kala Ghoda, where the Kala Ghoda festival happened, Jangir Art Gallery. And he looked back to me in a nice lazy way, and he said, Saab, jayenge, kaha, jaha Kala Ghoda hua hota tha ki jaha hai. So I said, what do you mean? And, and he actually knew the history, he knew it had been dislocated. So we, we, we actually take an elitist position on conservation without realizing that there are completely different readings of this. So therefore, the question of significance has to be interrogated, because we take significance and then conservation becomes this mad activity of reinforcing and reinstating significance. But I think in a condition like this, you have to construct significance sometimes. And again, so this is the work we did with the leg legislations for the fourth area. Of course, one moved it to urban conservation with an urban design training. One realized that unless you moved it into the sphere of urban conservation, it was hopeless to save these buildings. And this was the first legislation that occurred in India. And we were celebrated. I remember coming here and doing a workshop in Bimal's office when they were working on the Ahmedabad thing. We were sharing with Hyderabad that had actually done the work before us with Shori. But on the ground, nothing happened. And that's when one began to reflect about it and look at the fort area. And I realized that unless we construct a new significance, it's not going to make people connect to this area. And so we then began to work with these districts, give these districts new identities. Uh, so the Kala Ghoda area, which is the first one, the purple one, it was never an art district. But we constructed that significance because we found art was happening there. Now, that actually complicates the position of the professional because you have to then walk a fine line between constructing the significance and keeping the integrity of the architecture intact. Because then that becomes susceptible to all sorts of questions. And so that was the first experience where we started mapping it. Uh, we then invented this idea of the festival, something that one had learned from the SEPT festivals naturally. Uh, and we began to raise money from it. Uh, started doing things like street, street furniture, uh, raise money to restore buildings, which Abha Narayan. So one actually played the role of a client because I was part of a committee that was appointing architects and designers. With that money, we paved the central venue, which is now used for many events. 
it was physical improvement and our whole agenda was public space and physical improvement and using this area as a vehicle to do that and of course animating public space and all those good things then the question was how does one bring design and spatial possibilities to it so this is the prince of wales museum which is part of the kala ghoda we realized that this was a warehouse with one and two openings to hoist things in and a skylight this is just a facade it's all blank 50000 square feet of space so now this was again a self initiated project because we were now working as advocacy planners in the sense in the kala ghoda area and because we were trained as designers and you have to be acutely uh, aware of this as 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 something society has invested in you to do for society is you saw the spatial possibilities of this and so we actually talked to the director who created this project it wasn't something we were approached for to weave this warehouse to create 50000 square feet for the kala ghoda area which would then give it a completely different dimension in terms of an art district so of course it's a grade one building we did a conservation report and what we did was really what you see in gray were the only two interventions we added a veranda here using partly the stone that came out from the openings that we made here we followed the rhythm of the arches but in a new material and this is a reversible intervention with a completely different structure independent of it uh, and this is what it sort of looked like this is what happened to the shaft it allows circulation in many permutations and combinations and it's reversible so if another generation doesn't believe in this as an approach you can and this comes from doing conservation work that you can begin to make these modulations and then of course we did a master plan for it and from that we realized that all the security baggage was creating a mess so we created recently this visitor center uh, and a grade one building it was very difficult to get heritage committee permission but i was sort of really intent that we must make a contemporary intervention and not do something in stone with arches which is what of course the client wanted and so we did this drum that's where you give your bags in and it becomes a gateway building through which you go trees were incorporated it was all fabricated uh, in mumbai and it becomes a sort of gateway to the museum uh, reflects uh, uh, the sort of material of the museum so then on the periphery is what you do and we are all dealing with farm houses and i you know and of course this is the autonomous piece of architecture the palladian villa which gets its symmetry from the facades and the bungalow is part of that genre but this is the courtyard house which gets its symmetry and identity from the inside i think that is a fundamental shift and this is a story i always tell a pop star female pop star I'll give you that much of a clue had this building in alibagh i met the contractor i said who designed it he said he designed it i said how did you design it he said no she just gave me a picture of the white house in washington and i made it so <laughs> a lot of these farm houses are made with this way without engaging architecture that way now i think this is a question which is important because here is an example where architecture actually hardens the threshold within society between the rural poor where these urban people make interventions and i think architecture so we did a few projects we we tried to work with this as an agenda and so in these houses i'm going to show you the agenda is really to again uh to 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 really engage with this question of what these thresholds mean how can you soften them and how can you through with spatial arrangements steps this was a house for a young filmmaker uh, and what we did here was basically analyze what they were going to do and we realized they won't spend more than 15 or 20 days a year in this farm house and so what we came up with is an idea that we said your living room should be an offering to the village and so this is the living room because they said that when they were going to be there they would be out in the open in this steep wood grove so this is the living room those mora chairs just go in the door closes the roof collects water to the well there are two taps here so the caretaker hangs out here i mean the caretaker does homework with their children i've even seen a wedding happen there of course it's changed now as many houses have been built around it this is a very old project from 1999 but it was a way of creating at least a gesture of openness they've had no security problems uh, it's easy because it seems transparent but it becomes an offering in a sense of space uh, which is um, a, a, a generous gesture if nothing else there are no sacrifices we've articulated everything we've done all the fun things with architecture the series of courtyards he's a filmmaker so by these openings he modulates light uh, he does fun things but that's really what it looks like those are the taps that are kind of an offering to the village on this one we've done outside amdabad we decided that how do you double code it so 
It's we set the house in the middle of the orchard for that reason and the courtyard with the water body which just uses um, fresh water, there's no chlorination and there's a door here. So when these people are not here, the orchard workers actually dry and clean their fruit there using the pool and then they drain it out to the well. So it's in the middle. It's a paradigm shift in that, that the farmhouse doesn't command the orchard but actually is inserted in the orchard with the workers sort of embracing it. And again, you experiment with many different things of trying to create a sense of liquid, the, you know, the architectural thing. So I'm not getting into the architectural discussion of climate or material. I'm saying that's a given. And how does one build on that? And so the sense of here, we having studied here and lived here in the hostel and had to move to the terrace, I thought one thing one must create in Ahmedabad is an oasis because of the heat. And so one sort of created this, that you come in through the porbandar stone and the exposed concrete, which were all my gestures of the things I'd seen in Ahmedabad, but then you come into an oasis with a completely different coding. Uh, and a sense of refreshness. And then this is a house in Kunur, uh, which was on a tea plantation, and it was two, three acres of tea, and the client, of course, wanted to cut the tea, put a big object in the center, and we carefully mapped it with these mock-ups and things and put it in one edge. And again, this was a question of how does one play with the image, because suddenly to put a villa on a tea plantation with tea workers there was problematic. And we came up with this idea of a very simple house with a spine of granite, the local granite, the seating is embedded, it's sunken, so the views are not stock. And this is a light canopy, it's not stainless steel, it's just GI, which actually frames the view. And these are the three bedrooms which are cabin-like that you go into. It's otherwise a public and a porous sort of space. Uh, and of course, one indulge, again, I'm not going into the architectural details, but the images just tell you about the fun we had with light or with material or with craft or experimenting. But this proximity was what was important for me. I'm taking directions when I got lost going there recently, and I asked someone about the house and I described it, and they said, oh, the tea factory, we know exactly where that is. And for me, that was very satisfying that the house was referred to as a tea factory because it had subverted the image of a villa of a rich person on a tea plantation. But this proximity that the owners can be having tea there and tea picker can actually make eye contact is very important and something we've tried to build it. So you might say these are small gestures, but I think these become ways that we soften the thresholds and we modulate architecture in a completely different way. And of course it's about ambiance. You know in Kunu the mist goes through the house and it's a beautiful moment when all this reflects on that canopy and the wood, which is a very dark wood, begins to take on a completely different kind of aesthetic quality. And I think that sort of deep understanding and deep sort of play with these aesthetic qualities is also critical. Or this last example, where this is for a doctor. It's a big house because it's a living dining and it has three bedrooms and a guest room and a study. And the question here that we asked ourselves was, how could we fragment it in a way that you could use one module for a middle class person and it could become their weekend house? So the question here really is that, I think we are all fortunate that we engage with a very elite part of society and therefore we get to do projects which we can either fetishize we can use as research projects, that means they become crucibles. And I think interiors, for example, should be treated like that. They're crucibles for innovation, where we work with materials, we work at a finer scale, which I hope feeds back into our architecture. We can also do it with the scale of houses, because with that we grow into experiments that we can apply later. And so this idea of modules that they could either build this incrementally, they could build a thing which they could use as the family grew, they might add a bedroom, then they added a swimming pool here with a study, etc. a very simple vocabulary, but then it creates a richness of space as you see many layers and light quality changes. So each project really then becomes an experiment and I think that's how we like to at least deal with our projects. It makes it very interesting. Very simple materials, the scale is minimal so that it doesn't feel sort of overpowering. It has expansivenesses where you open doors, you appropriate spaces that are adjacent to it to expand it for climate. Uh, you, the water body becomes a central feature. It's a pool, but it also is a cooling kind of element. And you get these sort of layers through the house um, which it's all very transparent. They didn't want painting, so in some strategic locations we put this colored glass, which then reflects on glass, and then with time it sort of revolves around the house, so you also get this awareness of the time changing, the sun changing, it getting cloudy, uh, etc. So these are very minimal means in a sense, and they're experimental, and hopefully they'll play their way out into bigger projects. And here, a house in Chennai in an urban context for the Prakrit Foundation owner, and he had aspirations to also use it as a cultural center. So how do you code a house 
which can become a cultural center and as well as have the domestic kind of scale. Uh, and of course in the south, so you have a temple with the lotus pond, you have a water body at the bottom, but it becomes a venue also for concerts where this space, the living room all opens up and people actually sit, they lay out these beautiful carpets, the musicians sit on this platform in the water and it begins to become this kind of double code, which is interesting. So those resources then, not only in the way you use it in terms of frugal means and articulation, but programmatically, it doesn't become monofunctional. And I think taking anything beyond being monofunctional, whether it's infrastructure or a program, opens up immense possibilities in the way the public can engage. It's also a form of softening these thresholds. So I think our imagination has to go beyond just taking program per se and translating it as a diagram, but also beginning to nuance it. And I think this comes again when we understand the contingency of the context of the context and these meta-narratives which nourish this process in that way. And even the interior sort of becomes a venue for concerts. Or this apartment building which we've just done recently in Delhi, so the plants haven't grown. This is all going to be green. That's a misting system which cools the building. But this idea that what is happening in most societies in Delhi is single family houses have got divided in the 70s and now they're getting a big, and this is Ahmedabad too, the densification process. And so in that, how do you create more interest? So here we created three apartments, which are all different, but exactly the same square footage, but completely different. They are sectionally complicated in the way they sort of go across the whole site so that people, everyone has a frontage, everyone has access to the side margins, which are green, and we appropriated the site setbacks in a way they become spaces for the house. And that's the plan. And of course, there's a complex set of staircases uh, because that's how it works in section. And so the staircases then become really the architectural elements through which the sectional quality of the house is sort of explored and expanded uh, in interesting ways. And then at every level, you have little gardens, skylights. So you begin to get a different feeling for what an apartment might be in this otherwise crazy repetitive pattern uh, that is occurring everywhere in this hurry to densify and appropriate land. And that's the green wall, which has a misting system. So it will actually cool the building as you see it in play here. But uh, this is just quite recently done. And then on the street, there are places for people to sit. One has controlled the scale so it doesn't become a humongous apartment. And it has an ever-changing facade. Uh, on the street so it becomes more domestic. So although it's a large apartment with 7,000 square feet of apartments, uh, it actually creates a very domestic scale uh, on the street frontage on this long, narrow plot. Climate, of course, is very important, and how does one design for this? We've looked at Jeffrey Bauer, very inspired by him, but for me, it's very important. These buildings also work in the rain, and they don't get wrapped up as often happens. This is a think tank we did outside Goa, where we took this idea of a big canopy, and so it's just a big roof with many rooms below it, and the rooms can be used from above, too. So it's about 12 people can go there at a time and have meditation, yoga, meetings, all in this very sort of loose environment uh, with this big roof under which are these sort of, it's like a little streetscape uh, within it. And of course, the outside has textures that weather, and the inside, which is protected, is much more pristine. And that takes me to this last question where our obsession, and I, again, attribute this to my days at SEPT, where weathering was something we discussed in great detail. Now the debate has shifted from weathering of how these patinas would be added to weatherproofing. And now our obsessions are with sealant and insulating glass and what materials won't rust and what won't corrode and all of that. So I think, is there a halfway point? So I think weathering has potencies, a poetic potency, and we are talking about weatherproofing, which is banal in many ways. Uh, and I think that's become, I think, endemic to architecture, unfortunately. And this rolls back to conservation, because the life cycle of buildings is important. This is the house we've done where we were very mindful of separating what would have 15 years life and what would last for 100 years, which is the local stone that is quarried. This is in Alibag, done in 2005, so it's about 15 years old, 10 years old. Sorry, in 2000, it's 15 years old, 99. Uh, and so here, so this idea that the life cycle of materials becomes, so that's where conservation actually connects. So they're not disparate activities in the way one sort of imagines it. And craft, which emanates in these conservation kinds of projects, again, I'm sorry I'm repeating it, but we mustn't fetishize it, we must extend it. And so for me, this is again emblematic of the pantheon of gods with castrol, heavy duty oil. That's the reconciliation and the blur that we need to look at. So I'm going to now end with these projects. So the question is, that how do you localize global programs? And how do you globalize local programs? That's the rubric I'm going to use to show you these six projects. 
Global programs, we often don't have precedence for. This is what we are grappling with in this transitionary, simultaneous transitions that we are going through. So uh, electronic city project or IT company, a corporate office, we don't really have precedence. We are struggling with what that image should be. Capital is impatient, is pushing us in particular ways. Vendors promise architects dry construction, I mean, clients dry construction and finish the project in six months, and we are struggling with the good, beautiful qualities of material, etc. Similarly, local programs, whether it's something for the slums or it's a community center, tend to get caricatured as local programs. So we evoke the idea of the Indian village, for example, uh, in, in trying to, but I think. This is where these differences, which are local, have to be networked globally. And they will resonate very powerfully because the conditions of extreme urbanism that we are facing here in India, actually the world has to learn from. And so, and the aspirations of those people are different. And so I think how we make these reversals is very critical. So we talked about a Schumacher, or someone said, think globally and act locally. What is happening in the world is people are thinking locally and acting globally. It's exactly the reverse. How do we reclaim that? So this is almost a cliche of the local and global, but I think like context, it has much deeper possibilities. So this was the first project that our office did in 96, very early, first few years. So we finished in 96, so we were asked to do this much earlier. It was never published because the clients didn't want to publish it. It was for a machine tool company in Coimbatore. That was a site in a wonderful sort of landscape. That was a client brief. They said they had an Australian company that was going to get the curtain glazing. They said, give us a garden. If you can add a fountain, we'd be very happy. Put parking behind. Very simple <laughs> for someone who was starting that practice. I almost collapsed when I heard this, and I thought, my god, what an opportunity. But we worked very hard with them. We made models, and we basically laid this down. And we came up with the low-rise version, of course, because of this landscape with courtyards. Uh, and we felt this was India's most powerful machine tool company in many ways, and Lakshmi Machine Works. And we said, look, they need to be confident in this phase of our industry. We, we, we really engaged with them in many conversations. They were young, uh, which is nice. In the South, uh, people are yet open-minded. This is what I meant. Also, in that access, those new accesses, there's also an open-mindedness, but there's also pitfall because there's a lack of exposure, but there's a preconception in that other access just because of the rich tradition of what the modern landscape was about. So this is what the building was. It was three courtyards, finished in 1996, started in 1994 which were courtyards of different hierarchies. There were seven companies under the umbrella of Lakshmi Machine Works that occupied this. And so it essentially was a big roof, 20,000 square feet of roof, but a play of spaces within it. And as you modulate it through the building, the light quality, the scale, etc., changes from the street. It had a scale that wasn't intimidating. We created a window where you could stand and actually look right through the building. So you didn't see your reflection in a curtain glazing box, which is what corporate buildings were doing, but instead you penetrated it visually, if nothing else. And then you, as you went through the building, the scale changed. There were water bodies which cooled the building. There's a good six degree difference because Coimbatore is in the rain shadow, so climatically this works very well. The courtyards are placed so that you get this kind of telescopic feeling and the green collapses, so it gets much more intense. Uh, and as you go through the building, the scale changes. The clients were very keen on art, and we sort of, again, that was the second battle. I, because the building was so open, I was scared that if you put art on the wall, birds would drop on it, and then there'd be all sorts of problems. So we convinced them to actually work with art in the building, bring the art back. And Rajiv Sethi was brought on as one of the consultants. This he designed. And then we worked with a number of artists. I can't show you all the work, but I'll show you a little bit. But as you went through the building, it actually became the scale of a Chetinar house. This is where the owners sat. They had their own little balconies. They could look down. They could look at each other. So it became much more intimate as it went up and very open. This is Manjeet Bawa here, with, who died a few years ago. These were his paintings, which is what they would have put on the wall. But we worked with Manjeet and Rajiv and others, and we translated his figures as copper embossed figures, which became the railings for the buildings. And this is a motif then that appears right through the building as craft, uh, in a sense. And there are all sorts of narratives that he sort of uh, uh, unfolds as you go through the building based on this. We used a lot of the granite, which was from the local quarry. We cut the edges so it became the ripples for the waterfalls. So that this material was recycled. This is the late Sharad Shah, who helped us with Rajiv Sethi design a flag with 108 Lakshmis, the sacred kind of number, because Lakshmi machine works, which became the installation uh, at the entrance. And then with an artist called Yogesh Rawal, this was my favorite part, they were also the artists who do trucks in Kerala, who did a tree of life. Uh, they were traditional artists that 
on the walls painted the life of Lakshmi. Uh, so there were many, many pieces of art here. It's never been published. But this was the most favorite, at least for me, which Yogesh Ravel, who is a Bombay artist, or he's Bhopal, Bombay, Indore, I don't know. But he works with kite paper and he layers it. And here he took scrap metal uh, and he kind of layered it. Uh, and of course, inspired by the Mughal Jali, uh, you've got many patterns based just on scrap metal. Uh, and it's sort of scrap metal that comes out of the machine tool pressings, which he gathered very painstakingly. He found patterns that would be compatible, worked out a way of constructing them, and came up with a whole vocabulary through the building uh, of this sort of artwork. And I keep getting complimented. He should be, they keep, people keep telling me, wonderful tribal art you have, and I then don't have the art to tell them it's scrap metal. But I think what was important was, what was important was that the material that makes the wealth of the building is what people can touch, even if it's scrap. And I think that was a good sort of moment. And I think Yogesh sort of intuitively did this, um, I think, with Rajiv Sethi. But for me, extending that was then we just said, let's do this on all our openings. And then the density varies depends depending on the privacy that's needed for that space. And this is the kind of portals that tell you it's sort of suggest it's tribal art. So the second project is in Bangalore, which is for HP, great climate, air condition. Uh, this is Infosys, Electronic City. Wonderful autonomous glass boxes on lawns with sprinklers. Um, it makes for a fantastic campus. It's a, it's a real pity that they don't patronize good architecture. And this was HP. This was HP. They'd already done half their campus uh, by an architect that I shall not name. Uh, and these were essentially glass boxes. And we began to study them, the curtain glazing. And I think the thing that struck me were two things. One was that these buildings in yellow is the software area. In the center are the common facilities like coffee machines and meeting rooms, etc., which are social. But people don't interact in this thing. The second more, most astounding thing was that everyone uses curtain glazing. It's very expensive. But then what's mind-boggling is they spent much more money in automated blinds to cut the glare, because you can't work on computers with this. And that was sort of strange. So we said, how would we break that? We had some trees here. We created a street. We took all the public functions and strung it around with food courts on two ends. And that was the building. So it was a very simple diagram, food courts, coffee machines, meeting rooms, photocopying, all that stuff here. Food courts again there. This is the software area with shaded sort of courtyards with bamboo and pergolas, the generators at the back. Now, what was interesting was, of course, they wanted the LEED certificate. So the business as usual is 200 square feet a ton of air conditioning is business. You go to 290, usually you get your LEED certificate. We achieved 705 square feet a ton, but by no chemical or mechanical fixes, but rather by just not air conditioning 70% of the area. So the average, of course, went up. So then they decided they won't have a LEED certificate, but they'd rather have an air I mean, non-air conditioned building, which was nice. But for me, it was also important for another reason. You know, I would go in, I was, in, but this is also a building we finished in 2000, it's 10 years old now. But I was in my 40s and I would go in there and I could feel the average age of the whole campus of 3,000 people going up just by me entering there. Because everyone was in their 20s, really young people. And to be locked into rooms doing software stuff on a screen 24-7, they work on around the clock. One felt that for them to come out, to get their senses, to feel the breeze, to see light, to hear birds chirp, was very, very important. And that's what the building looks like. The staircases were clad in copper, so they were identifiable. These are the conference rooms that press against the, the tree. You can walk under the streetscape, which has these large cubes. It's very long. It's almost about 150 meters long. Uh, so these are the spaces within, which are naturally lit, ventilated double and triple height spaces, all the good things that make space interesting. The young people can rendezvous, they have terraces. But the light, the quality, I think, changes. The food courts are non-air conditions, different spaces so that you have intimacy and other kinds of experiences within it. These are between the software, where the shaded areas, minimum glass with minimum blinds, so you have no glare. It's much cooler, it's much more effective. And I think this whole sustainability debate is an important one for us to be critical about. It, the, the, the West has got a hegemony on it. It's become chemical and mechanical fix. The high-tech architects in the 80s actually appropriated the whole debate. And it's highly problematic. The work that was being done, and you know, the work Mr. Doshi and others were doing, Jane Drew, Maxwell Fry, uh, the work that was done in Africa, the tropical architecture, that all looked at just low-tech, 
high intelligence set of solutions. And now we call high tech high intelligence, which is like ridiculous. It's like the global and local. We've got to reverse some of these categories because just clapping your hands and lights going on and off is not an intelligent building. <laughs> so then this last project in the global programs is Hyderabad. And here, again, good climate. Uh, we were asked to do a corporate building for an infrastructure company. Now this is an old Google image, excuse me. But this is again the same autonomous boxes with glass on it. And we might, didn't have a choice of making anything more integrated. And this is an interesting company. They do infrastructure, they do highways. This is the heart of the company, which is a control room. You see a truck there. Every truck that this company has, has cameras on it. And what these guys are actually talking about when I was taking this picture was, where's the driver gone? I think he's gone to the loo. Why is he taking so much time? They're monitoring this thing in real time, calling him on his cell phone. So it's, they're using technology to deploy infrastructure through the company, uh, through the country. And then I started looking at Hyderabad, and it's interesting. This is a typical building of impatient capital in Hyderabad. These impulsive, I mean, these impulsive images of curtain glazed building. And with the Telangana problem, these were fantastic targets for riots because they were glass blocks. And so, so I found that the vendors were actually selling the fishing net together with the cloud. The details for how it's fixed, they were even giving you a choice of white or blue fishing nets. So what it tells you is that the compulsiveness of these images to use this particular kind of vendor-driven architecture was so strong that even in a condition like this, people were willing to sort of uh, actually embrace it. So we looked, and I was going to Jaipur at that time, and one looked at this beautiful little hut where they give you water in the summer. And we began to sort of study it and look at it, and we found it was really interesting because it, it's talking about low-tech solution. It's such a beautiful solution. This guy comes to work. When he puts his beautiful brass kettle out there, he's open for business. There's a stone on which the water falls and gets absorbed in the sand. No cups, no glasses. You clean your hands with the water. Every once in a while, he comes out. And what he does is essentially he um, what he essentially does is he sprays the hut to humidify it. Uh, inside the hut, there are uh, pots, which also with evaporative cooling keep the water cool. Some of you might have experienced this. It's hygienic water. It's cool water. It's the old cusp principle of the desert cooler, the beautiful light that comes through it. Uh, and it's a simple low-tech solution. I mean, I, I don't know. As a student here, there was a lot of discussion about this. Uh, this doesn't seem to be discussed any longer. But we thought, why not? There's a beauty to this. There's how can one be inspired? How can one extend this into a building? And so we came up with this idea. And of course, green walls are popular, but they get stuck on the wall, and you know they're really green walls. But here we said, how can we actually use the cusp principle? So we came up with a five-story building with gardens uh, on all sides. Uh, and essentially, it takes that principle, and it uses the screen of the gardens to cool the building. And both the humidity and the temperature, there's a quite a difference. We are mapping it slowly to get the right results because now the plants have grown, the plants haven't grown earlier. And there are two courtyards here that also can act as venting systems. And basically every facade then, instead of making the patterns in aloco bond, you can make them with flowers. Uh, and every facade has a different pattern. It's a trellis, uh, plants grow on it, and a spec building which is concrete. Now, what's interesting here is of course every facade is different. We grew these in a nursery. We figured out what would happen. But what's interesting, talking about impatient capital, the client told us we have to occupy this building in 18 months. So then the vendors all swooped down. Someone said, I can do it in four months. I can clear it, etc." So we actually talked to them and detached the impatience of capital, so to speak. Naturally, land costs money, and capital has to be realized, and the facade of the building. And we said, we'll give you the building in 18 months if you give us two, three years to grow the facade, so to speak. And they agreed. So it's like leaving the scaffolding on and hoping something will grow on it. The building was inaugurated with the cows and the dolaks and everything. Uh, and people occupied it while the scaffolding was there. And then we took, uh, we went back to our Coimbatore fabricator. He actually set up a little shed with 20 people to fabricate it. We gave him two and a half years to do it, which means in terms of economy, he could actually set up an enterprise. And it was all handcrafted. It's cast aluminum. We researched the alloys so that we would not get a darkening of it, but we would yet get a texture. And so you have a very beautiful texture uh, on the trellis, which had to do with the way the alloy actually was made. And this was all made in this village uh, with these people. They set up a business. Now they're in business. 
um, uh, it's it's uh, uh, in a small sort of shed. Uh, we invested only in one mold because the molds are very expensive, and so we worked out permutation combinations so you would get some variation. And these were the sort of biscuits for that particular alloy uh, for aluminum that incorporates the misting system uh, in the profile itself of the casting uh, and so this was made slowly there were different sizes of panels but never more than a panel that two people can't carry so that the installation was very easy and as the trellis went up the scaffolding came down in parts on every facade uh, and this is how it just sort of was stored when there were enough a truck took them and people the small pool of labor actually <laughs> constructed the different variations uh, to give us the building and then the plants began to grow that's with the misting system uh, this is maybe a year old or a year and a half old photograph and the misting system is based on the particular species so it's not a thing you can simulate rain it is not what the plants depend on but it actually cools the building and uh, and of course in the summer it's a wonderful feeling and refreshing uh, to go here uh, and as an experience I think the people there uh, seem to be very happy because it not only cools it but uh, creates this sort of ambience uh, and cleans it in a sense and now the flowers are begin be beginning to bloom I mean it's going to take many years to get this into a form this is what it looks like from the inside with the drip uh, uh, when, the, when the misting happens and you always have the presence of the gardeners which was one of the very very important agendas for us uh, in the building the presence of the plants the importance of the gardeners and their presence uh, and this is the landscape around it in a sense so it's sort of a counterpoint uh, to what you see and of course this is how it cools that's the the growth of the plants that's how the facade was detached in terms of time uh, that's the pattern of the trellis that's what it looks like and it's on a podium so we lifted the ground so the parking could go under it uh, and the podium itself becomes a very social space it's like a private park for the people in the building who are also all very uh, young in a sense and now you're beginning to get the density the different species we'll have to calibrate this with horticulturalists to actually get it grow the courtyards that's it one above the other they are based on the departments and the function of the building but then they create a different kind of spatial quality as you go through the building uh, that's the gym and the cafe we decided to put it together so when people were eating these guys were working out and vice versa <laughs> uh, and then this is cooling now you know when we talk and we've been mapping it and we are trying to now create a database so we could learn from it this was an intuitive response and I'll be very candid about it this wasn't scientific but my friend Sanjay Prakash actually has been very encouraging and we've actually started mapping it but you know the other important thing of the building is to reverse this we can talk about sustainability, we can talk about the lead, we can put sealants and we can do every chemical uh, fix to this building and get a lead certificate. But the way that it radiates heat to what's around it is also critical. And that's what's happened in the walkie-talkie building in London. They are melting cars around it because of the reflection of the heat. This is true. And so I think this factor of the impact of the building on the public sphere should be as accountable as anything else when we look at it whereas if this is the ambiance that you get within the building this is the director's room and that's the catwalk which has a drip irrigation hydroponic trays uh, so the the workers the gardeners the 12 or 13 gardeners that are employed here can actually traverse the entire building now this is very interesting because these people can go through the whole five floors of the building they may eye contact with their bosses this woman won't wear such a beautiful sari if she wasn't in the gaze of the so this question of equity whether it's just softening the threshold the way people can make contact with each other versus a boss driving in his Mercedes with reflective glass and disappearing into the elevator and the workers toiling in the garden outside how do you make this sort of slippage and I think this becomes one way and Sanjay Prakash also sort of wrote about this where he said these become true green jobs because in this case the identity of the company is contingent and tied to these jobs these green jobs because they have to make that facade happen they can't be even fired in a funny way and they make friends they they begin to actually open up a whole kind of dialogue because their presence is very important that's how it sort of sits in the landscape so let's go to globalizing local programs and look at what this might mean and this is a project for magic bus uh, which is an NGO in Mumbai that has a campus and they have five or six buses which are painted red and they call them magic bus 
uh, and they take these kids to this campus, which we did as a series of pavilions. And of course, the brief here was, we've got a campus, we're taking these kids out, we want an Indian village atmosphere, because they must get a sense of where they're, and I said, this is ridiculous, these are third generation slum dwellers, have no aspirations about the Indian village, they are going to be in these slums for 20, 30 years, even if the government gets its act together, and what else can we do to improve these? So we came up not only with this idea of disaggregated pavilions, but we studied the slums, and this is what I meant by how do you make a research agenda out of these projects? And I think that is fascinating. It suddenly makes a project very interesting, and I think we all do it. I'm just sort of trying to make these explicit in terms of the reflection and share these with you. So we went into the slums and we set ourselves a constraint. We said we're going to use materials that the slums are made of. We're not going to use any other materials. And so we mapped all the materials and the kinds of slums these kids came from. We also went beyond to look at the typology. So we said that a dormitory with a toilet could also become a public toilet in the community space, or a clinic with a dining room and the kitchen could become a clinic. With some. In Photoshop, we began to have fun and put these into these landscapes. I don't believe these landscapes are going to disappear overnight. Improving them is one thing, but how do you intervene in them is another. And these are very simple buildings with cement floors. There's a kind of modular ring to it because these are based on beds. This is the dining room. Most people sit on the ground. It's merely a pavilion. Uh, the modular bed get stacked up depending on the number of kids. But these kids who live in slums now all have access to a window independently. So the question of light and their own ownership on it. It also uses the intelligence of how slums are built in this sort of simple, quick way they get built overnight. So for me, the agenda was not only, but for not only the typological explorations, how these can be re-embedded, all of that, but it was also about familiarity. That these were environments where the kids were familiar with this sort of palette of materials. But also how these kids, when they became teenagers, might repair their own houses as they start seeing these materials used in different ways, as a kind of optimistic agenda that maybe it would be useful. Maybe this is just being idealistic, but I think it drives and nourishes what one does. And this is the gateway building, the offices, extending the roof, give us a covered terrace. I mean, all those simple fundamentals. And then how does it sort of embed? And then we began to look at slums, and that's when I talked to Sheila Patel, and I said, look, We've done this campus, I hope you guys can use it in some way. And she said, you know, we've just got a grant for doing 300 toilets for the World Bank. So I said, wow, who's designing that? That must be fantastic. She said, no, we tried approaching young architects. They weren't interested. And I suspect not because it's doomed to fail when you get into projects like that. And they had a hard time. They just had engineers who were doing it. Not that engineers design badly, but, uh, you know, I mean, architects can play a role. And sanitation is a big problem. And if you just look at the statistics of what we call the informal city, that those are, you know, these are the projections. Even if we alter our paths, those are the projections. And it's in, so it's in, so it's a solution that we have to engage with. If you look at the literature on this, the post-independence years was about denial. And that's why that image of Nehru and Cobb, you saw the workers living in slums. It was denial. In some forms of new nations that were formed, there was an arrogance and there was eradication. So a lot of the literature was about that. There was tolerance as democracies formed. There was improvement when the Aga Khan Awards gave the award to a Kampung Improvement Project. It was a celebration of accepting that these places would be in situ for a long time, and how do you improve it? I think we as architects should look at anticipation. Anticipation happens at two scales. One, it happens at this scale, where we talk about those good things of opening up affordable land, public transportation, access to jobs. Fine, we must be doing that. But we also have to work at this minute scale. This is a picture I took accidentally of this child coming out of the slum, going to school, and I didn't even notice I'd taken it till I saw it when I downloaded my computer. I was moved to tears looking at it because I thought, white shirt, white socks, smile on his face, he's probably defecated in the open before he got ready to go to school. That is amazing. So when one looked at the statistics in Mumbai, it's one toilet for 1,440 people. It's mind-boggling. Spark says one is to 800. They're more often. BMC says one is to 150. They're lying, obviously. Their, <laughs> their target is one is to 50. It's pathetic for us as a society to even have a target of one is to 50 because it means one toilet for six families. That's impossible. I mean, you might as well not have a toilet. So this is a humongous problem. I don't think we can solve it, but I certainly think we can get engaged with it. So we actually mapped. This was, again, one of those advocacy projects we did on our own. We cross subsidy. I could call this lecture cross subsidy because some sets of projects that I showed you as the first three cross subsidize these. And so 
we came up with a prototype, which was we stacked the toilets, we put the women on top, because the children and women have a very hard time in terms of safety. We put the caretaker on top, which is something Spark was already exploring. So the lowest cast, in a sense, gets the penthouse of the toilet. Uh, and then we wrapped it in green, because you know, learning from the KMC building, that maybe the association of flowers would change it. We used bamboo slats, simple materials. And then I went to one of my clients who we had done a farmhouse for, and he said, come spend an evening with me. I took that opportunity, and as he was pouring his first scotch, I told him the story about the toilet statistics, and he was moved, he couldn't sit. And at that point, I asked him for money for solar panels. And he gave me money for solar panels. Because, because the solar panels puts this toilet off the grid. And one of the problems, as you know, in these toilets, the contractors, to make money, they take the bulbs out at night. Now, when they take the bulbs out at night, it virtually means that women and children can't use these spaces, so it becomes dangerous. By putting it off the grid, you can use that community space, etc. So we were thrilled, uh, and we designed the toilet, and here it is with the slum, and we had all these boards, and the BMC, and this building went up to the plinth level, and it was stopped. So when I went to the BMC and asked them, why are you stopping this? They said, are you crazy? This slum, can't you see? It's very temporary. It's going to go. And you're making an iconic building. They have a community center. They'll meet. They'll never let us break the slum. So architecture was actually working against it. It was a strategic mistake. So architecture and design here was actually working counter to the whole project strategically. It was interesting. So we did another design. You know, we went, started going further out because we thought maybe they won't see us. But we went here. This also got stopped at that level. It didn't go. This was much simpler. It was a smaller slum, lovely community place, bamboo slag, all the lovely things we were excited about. So we said, so I told Sheila, look, let's find a remote location. So we found a remote location and we built it. With the solar panels, everything was built. Now, the children started using it. That's the housing they designed 10 years ago. No one moved. So it just proved our point that these improvements, these kind now, but you know, it, it, it was a mistake. Talking about impatient capital, I was the impatient architect wanting to design and build this. <laughs> and we had no roots in this community. Spark had no roots, and it completely failed. It was a failure. And I think the problem with these kinds of projects, when we're talking about these local problems, problem, we've got to be ready for failure. We've got to discuss the failures. We've got to engage with them. And these are things one learned as a student about community participation, about project. We had all sorts of R.I. Shah, many others who were mentors who taught us these questions. But you forget about this. Sometimes design also begins to overwhelm you. And so it's a reality check. I went back there, and you know, this was it was lovely for a few months. And then I went back nine months later, and it got reduced to this, and the government actually built their old blocks in front of it. And I found later the politician had actually had put a frontage for a contractor. They had taken the money. Uh, the the men in the, uh, in the the men in the slum made this the club. There were bottles of rum, television to watch cricket. Uh, it had become co-opted as something else because we weren't part of the political structure there. We rushed to do this to demonstrate our intentions were good, but we completely failed. And so I think failure is something, I don't know if we have a language that's adequate to interrogate this. And I think it's interesting because I think all you can think about is how you can fail better. So we did another whole set of prototypes. Uh, and this was a competition which we won. And then I was very disheartened that the, the NGO had already appointed the architect before they had the competition. So one failed again. Uh, and, uh, here, what we also did was put commerce into it. We found out many other things for the technology, community center. And actually, we thought we'd learn from all those mistakes and embed it better. And so it's, you know, it's what well, they say that in India, in India, the architect is like the mouth on an elephant. You get thrown off, trampled on, you climb on, you move on, you survive somehow. Uh, because it's all a combination of advocacy, patronage, lack of patronage, shifting politics, etc. So this is the last project. Four Mahouts and Elephants in Jaipur. It was a competition. Uh, we were appointed to do this. It's been a very, these are all failures, so don't expect too much. Uh, and uh, it was a, a BJP government project. And, a few months after the government was appointed, uh, I mean, the, uh, we were appointed and we started, the government fell. And as you have in India, the, the new government doesn't want to associate itself with the old government's projects. So we were the only ones who were really interested in the projects. And elephants are, um, uh, and you know, people get suspicious then. Uh, and elephants are, uh, you know, alien to this tropical climate. The Mughals and the Rajputs bought them there for ceremony. They take tourists up the Ambar Fort. The site that we got, this is how they live. 
uh, with the elephants here, the Mahout sap, it doesn't work at all because the relationship between the Mahout and the elephant is very complex. They're part of the family. They sing to them to sleep. And the site the government gave us was some site which was a sand quarry. So everything in dark had already been excavated. So there was really very little land to build. So that signaled also their lack of interest. And we found that this was going to be a difficult project. I got engaged in it because talking to the PWD engineers, although within the IS cadre you often have a symbolism of patronage, sometimes you have a good officer who pushes it a little bit. But working with the public works department here or the Umber Development Authority and their engineers, I realized a very deep resentment in this case, and I'll just, I won't mince my words, the Mahouts are all Muslim. And I would actually hear comments that they would ask me, why are you fetishizing so much about all of this for, they would use the word niche law. And that upset me tremendously. And we knew this was going to be a losing proposition, but we kept going. And we began to work slowly. We made it a landscape project. I realized very early that uh, uh, 40 square feet per family, low cost housing, one had seen enough of that happening. Uh, one has looked at projects of you know, uh, Professor Doshi, Charles Correa, many others, and one has learned deeply from those. And I knew housing is malleable, it will change. But if you could get the DNA of the ecology of the site right, then I think the life of these people and the elephants would be supported because that was very important for the health of the elephants. And so it became a landscape project. We looked at Google and we realized that water was actually draining through it. So it became a series of micro dams to kind of hold these water bodies. Only one or two of the second water body has just been built. And in the upper lands, we put uh, the housing. And of course, it became a detailed landscape plan. We looked at local species. And that's the transformation that happened just in three years. That's the same hill. And this is the depression. Those are the houses. Because the PWD built the houses very quickly for obvious reasons. The only landscape wasn't even in the specs. And luckily, because the government wasn't interested for three years, it just lay. Which means the moves that we had made allowed the land to regenerate itself and the ecology to come back. And that is exactly from the same spot three years ago. So you can see the tremendous transformation if you leave nature alone. The elephants started coming there to bathe from Umber, but they couldn't live there. They only allocated the houses more recently. And the statistics are quite mind-boggling. I won't get into them, but we basically have twice the amount of water that you need for 100 elephants. So they can last for two years. In the summer, the water drops. And one learned a lot from the local craftsmen because there was no spec, there was no budget to line the water bodies. And the local people told me the clay will do it in one monsoon if you can. And because we had three monsoons, we managed to do that. And of course, for the housing, we looked at all the lessons that we have learned, that the problems of row, row housing, how a 40 square meter house by adding one courtyard here and by adding a courtyard between three houses expands the house into a, a mansion as long as these three people can get along. It becomes wonderful. And how it can disaggregate and aggregate too. So we, we, we spent a lot of time on the architecture, so don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not saying architecture is not important, but sometimes you can't privilege only architecture because creating the, the systemic kind of outlay for a project is sometimes more critical. And we forget doing that because of our obsession with architecture. Something from the toilet I learned and we reversed in a sense. And so that's what a sign, you know, elephants can't lie on flat land. They have to lie on berms. So we had to actually, for every size, figure out how they would get up. They can't get up. So I mean, I jokingly say, I'll also one day do a book called uh, Extra Large, Large, Medium, and Small. <laughs> and that's what it sort of looks like. Uh, these are the thans. This is designed to put the thatch on top of it, so it also insulates the roof. It's structurally designed for that. Uh, you can see the trees coming back. That's the first water body. That's unbared in the distance. It's a low-cost housing project. It's malleable. It's weathering. It's changing. Tomorrow, they will allow them to plaster and paint it. It will be something that we won't recognize. They've only just started occupying it. That's what the towns look like. We made these windows so the elephants don't are not dangerous to the children, but the children can stroke them. So they were little case. That's how different towns have evolved. Some people have put lawns because that's their aspiration. Others have just sort of stored things, so it's completely different. They actually have flowers, they have bougainvillea, because they have more water than they actually need. And so when you talk about asymmetries in society, the middle class in Jaipur gets water tankers. But these guys, they're the poorest, they earn 5,000 rupees a month. They are lucky they get 1,000 rupees in tips, 6,000 rupees, they run a whole family, but they have access to water. So in a funny way, 
they are empowered. Just because we made water central to the project, they get a form of empowerment. And these are also strategic ways of at least making the gestures of connecting these asymmetries. And life corrodes architecture, life corrodes housing. People have occupied it, they cook out in the open. Uh, it's sort of, you can say it's shabby, but it's sort of life is beginning to take it over. The goats have moved in that watch over the elephants. You can see how the trees are beginning to shape the area. Uh, it's becoming quite dense. Satellite images, of, I mean, satellite dishes have come. We are talking, we've been making all sorts of proposals to rationalize and to stabilize the landscape. Bathing is a very important activity for the bonding of the elephants. So besides the health of the elephants, how the paint discolors their skin, their health is much better. We're working with NGOs who are veterinary doctors that look after these elephants. They're the ones who actually initiated the project through pressure on then Vasundra Rao, Ra Ra Vasundra Raja, who was the chief minister. This is the second water body, last monsoon. It was the first time it filled, it dried up, and now the second monsoon, we are confident it will stay. So the water is expanded. Some parts of the site have become extremely green, which are low lying. Uh, and you know, it's really regenerated itself. They're also social beings, so that we have to sometimes create these pavilions where for a few hours they come and hang out with each other. Um, but again, your generation on Facebook, uh, there's a whole new tourism there because everyone who goes to Jaipur loves putting on Facebook them feeding the elephants. So now there's an economy that is evolving around this and it's adding income for the Mahouts as a result of it, something we didn't anticipate at all. And this is a town that they didn't allocate and I went back and looked at it and you can see how the trees, the neem trees have just grown in three or four years. And you can imagine these would all just be beautiful canopies just because of the water. So it will create an ambience. The architecture will not be what we will celebrate, but I think life here would be interesting. We are now on our own making a series of projects. And I think this is an important message I'd like to give to the young architects. That sometimes you initiate. Our society is very suspicious. The moment you do that, they'll say there's something in for this guy trying to make money. Maybe he's getting a kickback on it. But I mean, I think this is part of our responsibility because we can imagine spatial arrangements. We can imagine the spatial possibilities. That's what society is investing in us. So we have to actually make these, draw up these dreams that people might invest in and patronize. So we're making all sorts of projects for them, for a little guest house, there'll be more income, uh, a little visitor center. I don't even know if these will get built. I mean, I don't even get an audience with, we don't even have a client to tell you the truth. We are hoping we will now with a new government, which is the one that actually patronized this project. Now they're children. So we renovated an existing block that was used for something else. We just renovated it. They gave us a budget, and it's going to become a school uh, for these children. So I'm just going to end on that note, which is I'm going to just take just one more minute of your time. And I'm going to say that, you know, as the world in South Asia, and in particular, I think uh, India, are becoming increasingly global, I think we have to be cautious about accepting that things are growing more, more alike because they begin to look more alike. Because I think when we engage with a deeper excavation of the site on which we operate, an understanding that draws both on the objective uh, reality as well as the subjective perceptions of that site, I think the difference, and this is, these perceptions is what I mean by the context, the context, a more nuanced reading of the locality in which we operate, I think actually the differences emerge even more strikingly than before, where differences are actually assured when things look different. That assurance is what fools us, and I think we have to be very critical of that. Because architects will have to find, and I think we are, and this is the kind of school that trains people to do that, to find a more rigorous way of defining the complex, emerging cultural fabric of multiple aspirations in the landscape of India's mutinous democracy. And more importantly, to see the cultural fabric as an ever-evolving landscape. In the words of Arjun Apudara, who's a social anthropologist, Culture is a dialogue between aspirations and sedimented traditions. So in these interpretations that we as designers make of a place of cultures, ideas of the future, as much as those of the past, have to necessarily be embedded and more importantly, have to be nurtured. Because I think in this highly pluralistic environment of the South Asian landscape and India in the center of this, I think we require planning and design mechanisms and attitudes that continually negotiate between the differences, blur these sort of polarities and binaries, where we, architecture is the sole instrument of place making versus temporality, which also contributes to the making the ephemeral landscape, the temporal landscape. These are as critical. We don't have a language that brings them into the discourse, for example, of urbanism. And I think blurring that is important, of creating conditions for habitation, celebration, using both architecture as well as temporal landscapes. 
the state and the market, that duality, why do we always set that up? The empowered and the poor, rather than, and I think we have to keep negotiating these binaries to blur them, rather than allowing one entity to prevail and remake the city in its image. And this is what I think for me, Working in Mumbai becomes emblematic of these struggles, of these conditions. Uh, and I think within the landscape of India, it's very unique. And it's a challenge that I think, I think only here we can see it in an extreme form and negotiate it. Because I think once the architect sees these various differences as being simultaneously valid, the challenge then is how to go beyond those polarized binaries uh, and how to deal with these sort of different worlds, with differing adjacencies, how to blur and bring these different languages of scale, uh, of aspirations, all together. Together in a coherent design vocabulary, in a coherent imagination of the urban. And I think if we are willing to accept the blurring of these boundaries, the simultaneous validity of these differences, to take them at their own face values and make it work, I think that's truly the space in which we will engage with architecture, with nature, and with society much more meaningfully. Thank you very much. behalf of everybody here. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing your work with us, sharing your insights. And let me say that all of us are very proud that we can say that you're one of us. Thank you very much.